Hey everybody and welcome to Let's Look at Mystic Veil. Vale. Or as I like to call it, John D. Clare's Mystic Veil. Vale. More like John LeClaire's Mystic Veil. Vale. You guys watch hockey in the 1990s? Philadelphia Flyers, 1997 to 2000, Legion of Doom, Eric Lindros, John LeClaire, Michael Renberg. Okay, now that I've gotten all the Johnny come latelys and casual fans to close out of the tab, what is Mystic Veil? Vale? Mystic Veil vale is a digital adaptation of a deck-building tabletop game that I have never played. However, if you've watched the channel for any length of time, you've seen a lot of Let's Look Ads or just the stuff that I used to play in general, uh, I really tend to like digital adaptations of board games uh, because there's no setup, there's no teardown, and you don't have to live in a house with six of your friends in order to play them consistently. So this, uh, it came out on Steam, and again, never, no interface whatsoever with the original game on my behalf, um, but I bought it because it looked interesting, and uh, I'm getting more into deck builders after after playing so much of Slay the Spire, and I've still never played Dominion, but I hear that this is very similar to that. Uh, I played, I don't know, maybe 70 minutes of this on Steam? Stream, and uh, it's interesting. I will say good, but I'll also say the watchability is a little bit difficult, so you're gonna have to bear with me here. Put the video on, get out the pen and the pad, I'm gonna explain some things as best as I can and we'll do it ourselves. But I, I picked this up on Steam, it came out uh, earlier this week on... I think it came out on Tuesday, not that that's necessarily that relevant. So there is online multiplayer, but um, I've been playing offline and I'll play it medium difficulty. I don't want to brag, but I won both of my first two games. Now you're gonna, I, I wasn't joking, you're gonna have to bear with me here for this first game, because we're gonna explain a lot of mechanics. I know you're looking at what's going on right now, and you're like, what on earth am I looking at? I'll explain it as simply as I conceivably can. First things first, this is a two-player game. I'm blue karma symbol, and I'm up against, uh, you know, 666 uh, bottoms up and the devil laughs here. Uh, the red team. The core gameplay is essentially it revolves around building your deck. And the deck is a simulation, or an abstraction, I should say, of, uh, you know, taking over a veil, or, you know, a, a land, more or less, that has some problems. And you're trying to take that land from, uh, you know, being cursed into being fruitful. And the way that you win is by getting as many victory points as possible. So there's 23 victory points available. Uh, once the victory point pool is exhausted, and you get the victory points by, uh, you know, buying these cards up here, which I'll explain in a bit, or some of these cards give you victory points every single time that you play them. Um, once you, uh, once those are exhausted, they tally up the victory points, whoever has the most wins. So the core of the gameplay is not as complicated as it might look just from looking at the UX here. And once you watch a little bit, I think you're gonna figure it out for yourself. But the core of it is that you have a 20 card deck uh, which you can see, I mean, you can't see the deck right here, but you can see there's 14 cards left, one card on top that's face up, and then five cards are out in what we can call, you know, like our farm right now. So the way that a turn goes, and I know you're like, I'm, I'm doing my best, I promise you, in order to make this as palatable as possible, because I saw when I was streaming, a lot of people, they see this and they just go like, play Apex Legends. I don't think that's fair. You know, not everything worth playing and worth watching immediately, you know, jumps out at you on the screen and you're like, I understand what I'm watching right off the bat. Another good example is Dota Auto Chess. Don't at me. That was a deliberate sip. Actually, that's not a good way to drink coffee. That tasted really bad. Um, okay. So the way that a turn starts is basically, you flip over cards from your deck, uh, stuff, 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 until you fill out the number of what are called decay symbols, which is this symbol right here. So on my field, I have two decay symbols, and then a third one is the next card that I would pull from the top of my deck. So it's a little bit like blackjack. Your turn will end essentially automatically if you hit four or more curse symbols, or decay symbols, I should say. So I can push this card over here, and then I could draw more and put them out, but if the at any point I end up coming, after I keep pressing this button, I hit another symbol, my turn's over and I can't do anything. And that would be really bad right now. So what I want to do um, is, uh, and by the way, you might be like, well, why would you do that? When why? What's the reward for the risk? Well, the more of these blue symbols we have, those are essentially our economy. So we can use those uh, to... Uh, what am I trying to say? We can use those to buy these cards up here, 
And then these cards will uh, give us more economy, or they'll generate other resources, which you can see, like the sun here, or the, you know, bear paw, or, you know, this green tree. And you aggregate those symbols to purchase these, and those ev eventually give you victory points. So the loop of the turn is blackjack, economy, victory points. And I'll show you, it's very simple. So this turn, one, two, three, we have three blue symbols, as you can see right here. We could hit, but I don't really want to. The way that you want to make your deck better and eventually win or at least compete is by um, making your cards better. Because you only ever have 20 cards. It's not like Slay the Spire where you add another card into your deck and your deck gets thicker. It's you basically have these cards and they stick around and then you add pieces to those cards to make them better, worse, or different. So for example here, I, for two energy I could buy Fertile Soil, Fertile Soil, or Seedling. What's the difference? Well, you can see what they generate. There's a cost is two up in the top right, by the way. They generate one each every time they're played. Um, and then the location of this little sidebar indicates where they go on a card. So if I bought this Fertile Soil, I could play it here. I could play it here. I could play it here. But I couldn't play it here because something already occupies the middle space. So for now, uh, I mean, Seedling seems like literally, assuming we can put it somewhere, a strictly better version of... Uh, the fertile soil. So I will buy that by clicking on it. Uh, sorry, I need to proceed to the next phase. There we go. And then I'm going to place it here. And it has an effect. Cancel all but one curse on this card. So I thought about putting it here and then we can stack up like maybe some heavy decay and it'll cancel all but one. If I put it here, it doesn't really do anything for us now because there's only one decay on it. But yeah, we could, I guess we could put it here and then put another decaying card and those exist. I'm just trying to see if there's any. Yeah, like the Hawk, for example, is a card we could place here and it would give one decay. And then if we placed another Hawk, maybe in the bottom slot, the card would only give one decay. And decay is something we want to minimize because the less decay we have, the more cards we can draw from our deck. The more cards we draw from our deck to play in front of us, the greater our economy is. And that's how you end up buying these big cards right here and by buying these then all of a sudden you're buying victory points or you know passive items with a big effect and you know you're good to go now if there's a real negative to the game beyond the fact that it starts out looking a little bit incomprehensible um the negative is that you never know like what your opponent does i mean you could go watch them play but really it's it's kind of like playing solitaire you take your turn it might take you a minute to figure out what you're going to do and then the ai is just like bang you know, it's not like playing... Uh, Hearthstone is a good example where, you know, it's a game that's similar to this, although it, it occupies what I would describe as a different niche, for sure. Um, but essentially, in Hearthstone, um, you know, you see what your enemy does, and, you know, they, they use their mana, and then a big creature comes out, and it has an animation, and you can parse what that means for the board. But really, like, in this game, you are playing against the opponent because you have a shared pool of cards to purchase from in the center here and, and at the top. Um, but you don't really see what they do. It's not like you're playing cards that attack their cards and so on and so forth. So it is kind of like two people playing solitaire against one another to some extent with minimal interaction. But I don't think that's a, a deal breaker. So I'll, I'll walk you through the turn step by step again. Uh, and we'll get to some cool cards at some point, but we need to build our economy first. Basically, I could draw some more, but there's always the chance that we hit a cursed land and end our turn. So rather than doing that, uh, I'm just going to proceed and I'll take a very simple fertile soil. And I don't really know if it matters which one we grab, but let's go for that one. And there, there's a couple of different approaches you could take, for example. One thing you could do, you know, there's some cards that make your... Um, they cancel out decay, as you saw. These cards are good to nullify these cursed lands, which are essentially, you know, dangerous cards to draw. Um, or the alternative is is what I've been doing so far, and that's using like your neutral cards that have nothing on them to try to build like some super economy cards. So uh, we have four energy. We could hit here, but I don't really want to. For four energy, we could buy um, we could buy a number of different things. We could buy a hawk. But I'd really rather put the Hawk on one of these other cards that we have, like particularly the one that cancels all but one Decay. Um, we could also go hard and try to get to like Mindful Owl if we just hit two more times. I don't really want to do that because we could bust on our turn and I think it's, it's not good. But what I'm actually going to do is I think I'm going to purchase the Wellspring. And the thing with the Wellspring is it has uh, like Leaf and Bear Paw on it. So by purchasing this and placing it on this card. Every time we draw this card, 
and play it in our field, we're going to get a leaf and a paw. Then I can use my leaf and paw to buy these cards, and I'm looking at that Azure Lake that'll every single turn give us one economy without even having to do anything because this is just a passive. It goes here in our improvements area, but the, the terminology I don't think is relevant. So it'll start to move a little faster pretty soon, but right now our deck is garbage, so, you know, it's to be expected that things are bad. What is this? Earth Chant Chorus. Other advancements added to this card cost two less. Oh, I like this, actually. Peacekeeper Druid. Once this turn, if you were to spoil, you may discard your on-deck card instead. So basically, this allows us to, if we're feeling a little lucky, we basically hit one more time, and then if we're going to spoil, we can activate this card, discard this card, and get one more chance. So I will uh, actually take this. And I don't know, there might be a good case to add it to one of the... Well, we can't fit it on our Cursed Land anyway, so... And we're just getting through our deck really quickly because, you know, that we only have 20 cards in it to begin with. So again, I don't really know what the AI is buying, and that's kind of what I would consider a negative of it for sure. Um, so, again, we don't really want to hit on this one because we didn't get our card with the ability. So we have four energy. does allow us to buy a decent chunk of stuff. I kind of, I, I think I, the thing with Dawn Singer is it's an okay card. It gives you one sun every turn. However, uh, every turn you play it, I should say. Um, it really works best when we can stack up helmets with it. You know, none of these cards really, until the Ent Elder, have helmets. So I don't think the Dawn Singer is the right thing to do. I'm going to get the Wayfinder. I think, which allows us, it gives us a bear paw, and it also gives us a victory point when played, and it all, I, th I think at least, and it gives us one energy when played, so that seems pretty good. Let's just toss this on one of our neutral cards and, and proceed here. So hopefully you're, you're starting to get like kind of a feel for it. So we only have three energy, that's really bad. Um, and this might be a turn where we get into like the gambling aspect a little bit more. So I have three energy. Sure, I could buy a fertile soil or an earth chant chorus. Who cares, right? I guess what I could do is go like earth chant chorus and then add a fertile soil for zero to the card. But I, what I'm going to do here is instead, you know, initiate kind of like the blackjack aspect. So if we hit another curse here, we're going to bust, but I'm going to try anyway. We didn't bust. Okay, so what is this again? It's just good uh, economy for us. So we could stop here if we wanted to. But if we draw and we don't have a cursed land here, we can actually pick up a big improvement. So let's let's try that. Good, we didn't bust. So I'm going to say, you know what? Let's stop. We took a big risk, but it worked out. So let's go to our planting phase. And all of a sudden, you know, now, because we have uh, the right resources for it, we can buy Azure Lake. Now we get one extra economy every single turn, and you can see how your deck starts to build like this. If you've ever played a game like um, Splendor, it's actually very serious, uh, not very serious, very similar to this. In the sense that when it first gets started, you know, you're, it's a two to four player game you, with a shared market in the center. Everyone starts and they are like, I'll buy this bad card, I'll buy this bad card. But eventually, you know, having more and more bad cards fuels your economy, or not, not ideal cards, fuels your economy. And then uh, you start to be able to buy really good stuff, and it just, you know, almost exponentially accelerates. So I'm going to buy uh, the Hawk as well, at 5. And then I'm going to add it to this card. And then if we can add one more decaying card to the bottom, this won't be so bad. But, I mean, the Seedling is not particularly strong. It's just decent. The Hawk is good, I think, but also dangerous. So that's the end of our turn. Good turn, though. I hope you're starting to see what's going on here. If not, I understand it is a little impenetrable at first. I, I truly believe. So we're going to Blackjack again because I don't like what we got going on here. We're in three energy at this point. I'm willing to take a risk. All right, so we busted because it counts the value of your on-deck card when counting this from a design perspective. So we, we did bust, but the good thing about busting, if there is one, is that we... Um, store one energy that we can use on our next turn as well. So this time you're starting to really see the value of what we got going on here. Um, we have eight energy now and we've got actually like a pretty good setup of these as well. If we hit, uh, you know what, I'm going to hit just to demonstrate how this works, but I'm going to walk you through it. So if we hit, we get this card, which comes with one more decay. 
The Seedbringer doesn't cancel it. Remember, it cancels all but one. So, we could bust if our next on deck card is a Cursed Land. However, which is one of these. However, if we bust, or spoil, um, we can use our ability from the Peacekeeper Druid, now that it's out there, to discard that card and basically get one more chance. We don't get to stop the effect of the next card that's coming, but we do get to discard the one that caused us to bust. So we, we have another chance at greatness. Let's try again. Hit it. It's a cursed land. So you know what you do? You go Peacekeeper Druid, activate ability. This one's not a cursed land, and thankfully our turn is not over. So now we have nine energy. Um... I am definitely going to buy a Stream of Vigor, which means this is a level 2 improvement, which is nuts. Um, so every harvest, we get two extra energy to, to purchase, which I... Oh, I don't want Druid's Song. Get out of here. Now we can really purchase some awesome stuff. So I think um, I'm going to get... And I'm trying to make like some Wombo Combo cards, basically. I'm going to get Mindful Owl. It's a beautiful card. It allows you uh, to discard a card every time you play this card, which means whenever it comes out, we can get rid of a card like a, a neutral curse land that just has decay on it. So now, you know, we basically get extra draw, which gives us extra purchasing power. And I'll, um, I mean, I'll toss a podlings on, I guess, as well, just to make sure we're not wasting our energy. Oh, and I can still buy a world tree as well for two victory points. Sure, let's do it. So you're starting to see it accelerate, I hope. And this is really around the point where I started to understand this is where I, um, you know, learn to appreciate the game. I will say I don't think it's the most watchable thing, but it scratches that strategy in Deck Builder Rich, and uh, it, it has a novel twist on it. You know, I don't think it's fair to just be like, you know, oh, you know, just play Slay the Spire instead. You know, I, I don't think that's really fair. They're games that are two very, very different styles. You know, Slay the Spire is kind of like a roguelite. This is much more of a pure deck building strategy game, and I, I think it works really well in that regard. So I'm not going to hit, because, I mean, we already have seven economy based on all the stuff that we bought. Uh, all the advancements, I should say, which you can see down here. Um, so we'll, we'll just move on to our next phase. And, uh, I mean, Calm Weather seems pretty good. Look at your next on-deck card. You may discard it. So anytime our next on-deck card is garbage, we can discard it. And if it's not garbage, we can keep it up. We got a really good thing going on here, I think. Uh, this turn sucks pretty bad, though. So, I'm just going to hit. Let's see. Alright, we busted. <laughs> and our deck, we're drawing pure garbage right now. I hate to say it, but it's it's the dang old truth. So, we got six energy. Um, Mindful Owl is really good, so I'm not going to risk anything. I, I really like Mindful Owl. I shouldn't say it's good. I don't know if it's good or, or not. You're not going to believe me, but I, I really feel like we're just drawing garbage right now. You only have like eight cursed lands in your deck, and we've hit like... Six of them out of our first seven cards? So I'm going to try to hit again. Let's give it a shot. This is not a cursed land. What does this do? Oh, when played, you... Right, you may look at your next on-deck card. You may discard it. Okay. Do we want to discard it? Yes, actually. Even though it would generate resources and victory points, it would cause us to bust. So let's discard that. And then we got a cursed land anyway. We have seven energy. Just looking. Look, the thing is, I don't have anything I really like. But I'm going to buy a Druid Song anyway, because it comes with a purple resource. And purple is a wild card. So, we can complete this card, and it's beautiful. One more thing you need to know is that, um... And I guess maybe we might as well, but... Eh, I don't know, adding a Fertile Soil... I guess we're never going to add much else to these cards, so it's not that bad, but... Uh, each card can only have one activated ability on it or maybe one ability at all um so for example if we tried to throw another card on this like two mindful owls we don't get to discard two cards we actually discard one of the effects so we only get to discard one card so we should get rid of a curse land you know it's basically the worst card in our deck here we got good things going on here so they took their turn i still don't know what the ai is doing but it looks like i'm winning fantastic what do you you have no active effect so we are running a big risk if we choose to uh, if we choose to hit here. Although one of the two cards in our deck, I'm trying to think now. What's in our discard pile? One, two, three, four, five, six. Wait, no, no, no. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So one of our last two cards is um, if you bust, you can try again. Spoil, I should say. One of our last two cards is a Cursed Land, I think. So I don't really want to risk it. Although, no, 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 wait. Seven, eight. I, I actually think if we hit, we're fine. Let's see. I'm a genius. Keep hitting. Still a genius. Um, although, I don't know if we want to hit this one. I think we'll... Oh, we spoiled, so we have to... Sorry. We have to activate our ability. And we spoiled again! Okay, I'm very dumb. I'm not a genius any longer. I should have stopped hitting. It, it got a little out of hand. I'm sorry. It's okay. Just seeing if there's anything new in here that we really like. Not really. Let's hit. This is... This is kind of a garbage draw, but getting the Mindful Owl will turn it around. We get rid of one of our garbage cards, and okay, um, do we want to hit again? And I think with eight, we probably want to just, we want to stay cool. I just don't know what we're going to do, because like our, we have like no resources either. You know, I'm willing to give it a try. I shouldn't, and this is a good example why, because now I've spoiled twice in a row, probably letting the AI get a little further ahead. But, um, you know, the idea, I think, is we're, we're basically trying to build one killer turn where we can really accelerate ourselves. And this might be it. we got a lot of good resources going on here. We did maybe open the door for the medium quality AI to get in. Let's see. So, I don't want to hit. I'm scared. Even though we could avoid busting once, it's not risk-free because if we get another card with the K right after it, it's a problem. So, let's pass go into our harvest phase, then buy some of this great stuff right here. Gain one, okay, this is beautiful. Gain one permanent decay, or sorry, one permanent regrowth. Green symbol just means it cancels out one decay. So now we can get one more decay before things become a problem. Um, and then, this gives us victory points. And it does allow us to also, the victory points is bottom right, by the way. It does allow us to build like a helmet synergy because you can see like gain one for each gain one uh, victory point for each helmet on this card, but it does come with the K, which is dangerous. But I think it's it's worth trying. So let's let's do it. So we'll get a stag and we'll put it like right here, and we can't really do too much else. Maybe we'll just toss one of those there. But if we can build like chieftains uh, on top of the stag. Then we can start to really accelerate our victory point production. I have to run some numbers real quick. One, two, three, four. So yeah, we already have our our green has already been exhausted here. So we have twelve again as our economy, um, and our victory points are just getting out of control. Dread coil cobra. Oh, dude, I will if given the opportunity, and we do have decent resources as well. Um, given the opportunity, I will always buy a Mindful Owl. I think it's so useful, and I would rather put a... You know what? Actually, putting a Hulking Thornhide here might even be better, because it it doesn't count the decay from it because of the Seedbringer. Remember, this is... Uh, or Seedling, I should say. Cancel all but one decay on this card. And then I'll put a Mindful Owl here. So, as you can see, basically the, the hook of the game, and I recognize, by the way, I'm not ignorant to the idea that this is a little bit... It, it's not a game that's for everybody, and I think that's extremely obvious. However, uh, it does scratch a nice strategic itch. Like, I'm a... I'm a sucker for this kind of game, and even though the, it took me a while to get into it, uh, I, you see the strategic depth pretty quickly, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I don't even want to risk it here, but I don't know what I'm going to buy. We have 1-1. One, one. We can buy... Oh, dude, actually. Sunstone Airy is really good. So we can spend energy to convert any resource into a wild card, which just makes it way more flexible to purchase these. And I honestly think, like, pretty... Within the next, like, five or ten minutes, the game's going to be over, and I do think that we're going to win. Uh, give me a Moon Wolf. Just for, just for economic purposes. Whoops. That's my bad. You know what? Sure, toss a fertile soil on that as well. Why not? Alright, we will discard our cursed land. We will discard our other cursed land. And the Mindful Owl is paying incredible dividends. Do we want to discard this fertile soil? No, it's fertile soil. Look at that. 15, 2, 1, 2, and 4 victory points. 
all of a sudden, it's, it's all coming back to me now. So I'm not risking this turn by, by trying to hit, even though we have activated abilities. So, um, give me the Feral Grove. Well, definitely do not use a purple for it. We should have done that differently, maybe? You know what? Actually, check this out. I'm going to get an Exodus Road as well. So we're going to use our Sunstone Airy, and we're going to turn a green into a wild card for two energy. Now we have two energy. You can get more Sunstone Aries, but like at this point, I just want to buy victory points, I think. All right, so now we have 13 energy. Let's go back to our field. And um, we don't have our helmet. Oh, we do have a helmet-rich card. So now we buy a Feral Chieftain. No, wait, wait, wait. How much? 13? We buy a ha- Oh, but that's going to be so dangerous. Yeah. We buy a Feral Chieftain. And now we get extra victory points every time this card gets played. Because uh, we get three because it gains one victory point for each helmet on the card. So we're building like a helmet-specific card here. I don't want to- Helmets tend to come with decay, which is dangerous, I think. So I don't really want to put like a hawk out here as well. Let's just uh, complete the card by adding a Fertile Soil and- uh, Keep it keep it real simple. So yeah, I, I think we'll win now. We're we're definitely you know crushing the AI. I'm extremely smart as we all knew from the get go. And you can see we're drawing so much more gas now. Whereas on the first few turns we was like curse land, curse land, blank, curse land, blank, 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 curse land. You know, now we're drawing like we're getting a, a serious economy. It's a great abstraction for like a, a real. And I, I say that without a hint of uh, like. Malice, but like a quote-unquote real strategy game, uh, and I think that's what's really cool about it. I think that uh, th this is the kind of game that it it's it's the kind of board game you don't bust out at home uh, with the people who want to play Monopoly. But it, I really feel like it's it's very similar to Splendor, and uh, it's also pretty similar to a game called Jaipur, which uh, you know these are pretty well respected. Uh, board games, and if you're an aficionado, uh, I think you might get a you know scratch the itch here. Now, let's just see. So we will go, move on from our planting phase. Um, at this point, I'm kind of like, you know, let's just buy raw victory points. Doesn't really bother me. And uh, we have uh, our helmet rich card is doing great stuff. Uh, I love this. Cancels all decay on this card. Unfortunately, there's nowhere for us to put it that would actually cancel any decay. Ex no, 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 because I was like, we could even put this there. You know what? There actually is. Check this out. So we can cancel out the one decay on that card, which is not particularly amazing, but, you know, it is what it is, I guess. And, uh, you know what? Gain one energy for each helmet on this card. Sounds good to me. There's only yeah, It's over. This is the final round, and, and we will definitely win. So, do you understand what's happening? Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, I think what you need to know, at the end of the day, is that this is a, is a deck building strategy game. I have no understanding at all of what happens in the tabletop version. Seems a little bit more complicated from, from teardown setup, but I don't know for certain. Secondarily, is it perfect? No. I really think that if there's a problem with the design of this game, and I don't know if this is unique to the digital version, but never knowing what the computer does is kind of... Uh, I mean, I don't want to say that it's it runs counter to the design of the game, because I don't think that's fair. Maybe the design of the game, from a digital standpoint, is intended to be like, you know, for people who are like, man, I love playing Mystic Veil, but I really love taking my turn, and when the enemy takes their turn, I don't really care, because we're not interacting that much. So anything that cuts down on the enemy turn time and the time it takes for you to get back to your actions might actually improve the experience. But from a competitive standpoint, for somebody who has never actually played the game, it does seem like I'm playing solitaire against another person. Which, again, I don't know if it's a design flaw or just a design foible, but it is what it is. Uh, apart from that, though, I think it's a very interesting deck-building strategy game. Do a little bit of a time to learn, for sure, but once I got over that learning curve, I've been having a good time with it. And uh, online multiplayer, all I'm going to say about that is it strikes me as one of those games you're not going to be likely to buy it, queue up, play against people. It's you and your friend buy it. Or you and, and it does go up to four players. You and three friends are like, hey, let's meet up in Mystic Vale and play. And that's cool. Um, 
it's uh, anything that allows for those kind of tabletop experiences, uh, but without requiring you to be in the same physical space is beautiful. And as far as I'm concerned, if every single tabletop board game came out with a digital version that was this workmanlike and, and well done and competent, I would be an extremely happy man. Either way, that's Mystic Veil. Vale. I hope you enjoyed what you saw and uh, may have been intrigued by the game. If uh, you're interested in picking it up, go do so. It's on Steam. $20 Canadian, roughly. I don't know what the conversion to American is anymore. The, the foreign exchange is up and down at all times. Uh, I bought it myself, and I, I feel fulfilled in that purchase. If you enjoyed the episode, of course, click the like button. It helps out a great deal. Subscribe if you want to see more in the future. Hoping to add a little bit more variety to my YouTube channel. Instead of just playing uh, the same deck builder over and over, let's play a different deck builder temporarily. <laughs> Thanks for your support. Follow me on Twitch as well. Twitch.tv slash Northern Line, and I'll see you next time. See ya!